And I was in this lady's kitchen, and we're talking, and we're just having a great conversation. And I'm thinking, I got this lady's going to be, she's going to be a big player in this campaign of mine. And she goes like this, looks at her watch, and she says, now what time do you think the candidate's going to get here? <laughs> so, I left politics. I got out of it all, and I went into the private sector. I worked in business at Lehman Brothers. I traveled all over America as a, a banker catching airplanes. I spent a lot of time in the Silicon Valley. I worked on on financial services and heavy industry uh, clients, everything across the board. And then you all know that I was a giant television star at Fox News, okay, <laughs> giant. And if you don't remember it, I have tapes out in my car that I can pass out to you. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we tried to figure out how to turn people's televisions on. We didn't care if they watched or not. We just wanted their television sets on. So, um, Everybody in life has a purpose, don't we? And I wanted to tell you this. I don't care if you're 90 years old. We all have a purpose. Our purpose is not to just drift away. Our purpose is to heal, I think. I mean, as best we can. And we don't have to be Mother Teresa. But we have to do things, whether it's encouraging our grandchildren or encouraging kids to stay off the drugs or whether, I'll tell you one of the things that we've done recently in Ohio, I love this. If you're a senior citizen and you volunteer in Youngstown, Ohio, for one of three separate areas where the community has needs, if you volunteer 100 hours in a year, we will give you three free credit hours to go to Youngstown State University or the community college. Now, a lot of seniors might not want to go to Youngstown State, so guess what? They can gift those credit hours to their grandson, their granddaughter, or somebody that lives down the street, because we really honor the work of our senior citizens in the state of Ohio, and, and so we all have a purpose. So I felt called back to run for governor, and Ohio was basically dead as a doornail. It's part of the reason I ran. I knew that I couldn't do any worse. Um, sort of like thinking about running for president, right? I mean, uh, so I go in there. I win. I'm the first person to beat an incumbent in 36 years. And I get in there, and we have an $8 billion hole, 20% of our general operating fund. We have lost 350,000 jobs. Our credit's going down the drain, and people are depressed. So four and a half years later, today, we went from eight billion in the hole to two billion in the black. We have cut taxes by the largest amount in America by almost five billion dollars. We have grown private sector jobs by 350,000, so we recovered everything that we lost. Our credit is rock solid, and, 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 if you are drug addicted, we're gonna help you. If you're mentally ill, we're gonna help you. If you have a son or a daughter, a young or adult, and they're autistic, we're going to include you. If you're developmentally disabled, we're going to try to mainstream you. If you're the working poor, we want to give you a chance to get up. If you're in the minority community, the system has to work for you as well as for everybody else. And look, we, after my first year in office, I had a 28% approval. You have to work to be that unpopular. And then with this election, I won 86 out of 88 counties. I had 26% of the African American vote, 51% of union households, and 60% of women. And I think it happened for two reasons. One is I have a great team of people. And we've been able to restore some sense of economic growth, which is vital. But secondly, we want everybody to share. We want everybody to rise. We want the drug addicted to get to get fixed or get rehab. We want the mentally ill to get their medication so they can work. And we want to honor everybody. And that's what America needs. Three things for the country, and then I'll take your questions. One is we do need to move towards a balanced budget. We need to have a legitimate, incredible plan to do it because our number one purpose as elected officials is to be part of the program to create jobs. That's what helps our families. It's what helps our Look, I got two 15-year-old daughters, you know, what do you think I'm thinking about their future, you know? Um, I also, secondly, think we have to rebuild the military, and thirdly, the message has to be unity. No more of all this, look, let's get out of this bad mood. 
we've got we've got challenges in our country, but we've been through civil wars and world wars and depressions and 9/11. It ain't that bad. And it's up to us to get that fire, you know, built back up again. This is America. I think we can do it. We all work together. So. So I'm going to go back here. Yes, ma'am, right here. Yes. Marvelous. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Mandog region. Uh, you were talking about talk radio, and this morning on our talk radio here in Keene, WKVK, Danny Mitchell has a guest on every Friday. She is the self-appointed mouthpiece for the Democratic Party, Arnie Madison. And she alluded to the fact when questioned, a caller called in and asked her her take on the 16 Republican candidates. She said the one devastating candidate for Hillary Clinton to combat will be John Kasich. You have done the plan. We planned that call. Why should we get We planned that call. My question Why? to you is the fact that she alluded to the fact that you and Hillary have a very similar <coughs> way of governing and meeting executive decisions. I found, uh -oh, that very, worse I, found, I, I found that very offensive, and so I give you the opportunity to please share with us at least your top three of why you are so different from Hillary Clinton. Uh, well, first of all, let's talk about the fact that when I was just about at zero in the polls, it leaked out here a couple weeks ago that the candidate that they were most afraid of, and this has been on on Fox News and a couple of the other networks uh, is John Kasich. And I, I think the reason is is that what we've been able to do, you know, what, what, what I and my team have been able to do to help improve the economy, make sure no one's left behind, and I'm a happy guy. And I think that's, I think that's something that worries them. I mean, we'd have to ask them. But, Look, the differences are real simple, and I, I do know Hillary. Uh, I know her. I've, I've, you know, when she was doing her health care plan, I invited her to my house through a liberal Democrat friend of mine, and I invited all the Republicans who were concerned about Hillary care, and she came and she talked, and and we talked, and I'm not sure she listened, but it was okay. Um, but look. I think they're, they have a whole different view of what makes the world work. She proposed the other day that they should raise the, the taxes on capital gains. Now, I just came from this nanotech company over here. It's pretty awesome. 70 employees. When people take risks and they go out there and stay, stick their neck out and invest their own money, the last thing we ought to do is, is you know, cut them off. We ought to be helping them. We should be rewarding people to take risks and create jobs, because it's our kids who get the jobs, right? So their economic view is, is completely different than we are. They think government is the solution. I go back to the old Reagan deal. Government is a last resort, not as a first resort. But not like wipe out all government, because government is needed in some areas. So I think their approach is big government solutions. My feeling is we should be shifting a lot of power back to where we live whether it's education, whether it's job training, whether it's health care, it needs to be where we are. But folks, with the control and the power, we have to run programs correctly. We can't be, you know, politicians can't be worried of their own shadow or losing an election or not taking risks. I'll just give you an example. We all believe in local control of schools. In my state, and probably true in your state, 40% of high school graduates are not prepared to go to college. They have to take remedial courses to get ready to take college courses. We're not asserting ourselves enough at the local level. So I do believe we ought to shift this power back to where we are. They believe there ought to be more power. And to give you a good illustration, a simple one, the federal government's doing so much, they're not doing so many things very well. When I was a congressman, if you wanted to go visit the White House, it'd take two weeks to get you tickets. Now you just jump over the fence, you know? Um, and then on foreign policy, okay, on foreign policy, they have a general philosophy that we should leave from behind. How do you leave 
from behind. And as a result of that, our friends have begun to doubt us and our enemies have become emboldened. And we need to be strong. We need to have a strong military. We need to be mobile. We need to be lethal. We need to be those things. And I'll tell you another thing. They talk a good game, don't they? In my state, what we have done in the area of minorities, we're the first one in Ohio, if you want it in government contracts, the white folks get 85%, minorities get 15%. Do you know that they have never, ever met that goal? Till I became governor, we're meeting that goal now. We're the ones that banned the box. If you were a felon and you were a, a young person and you did something stupid, you go to apply for a job in the state of Ohio, and guess what? We throw your application in the trash. We pay on the box. We'll find out if you were a felon, but we want to give you a chance to get up on your feet. We've given people a chance to work their way out of prisons. Our recidivism rate is 37% compared to a 50%, and they're virtually 50% national average. You see, they talk about how they care, but they don't deliver the stuff because they're so, they're so founded in bureaucracy and red tape I, I think I've said enough, okay, <laughs> if you want more. But I think it's good that that lady is, for our, our people, would be thrilled to hear they're worried about me, okay? You think they should be or shouldn't? What do you think? Huh? I mean, I'll tell you one other thing. Where did we, as a party, ever think that because we deeply care about another fellow human being that somehow that's liberal? How did we ever get there? See, to me, the epitome of being a conservative, the epitome of being a conservative is to recognize in America that a mailman's son can run for president and maybe win. That's what we, you know, and so we see people who are down on their luck. My mother used to say this, Johnny, one more story. <laughs> when I was a kid, these stories are revealing. When I was a kid, we had a, a, two people that brought their ponies up to our school. And we'd get so excited, we'd go up and ride these ponies. And my mother said she wanted to see what the heck was going on, so she went up to the school with me. And I don't know what the pony ride cost, maybe 25 cents or something, and she ended up giving the kid like a dollar. I don't remember the exact numbers. And we were walking home together, and I said, Mom, why did you give that guy all that money? And she said, did you see his eye, Johnny? Did you see his clothes? We have to help people like that. So I believe my mother had it right. It's a sin not to help people who need help, but it's equally sin to continue to help people who need to learn how to help themselves. So it's help and it's personal responsibility. And that's the case. All right, first hand up, I'm gonna go to you. What do you, what do you got on your mind? Because you got something on your mind, sir. Yes, as you go forward, you get the nomination. Most of the Republicans will vote for you, but that's not enough. Given the demographics, how do you get the Red Dogs? How do you get the independents in Florida, in Ohio, in New Hampshire to vote for you? Because without that, we're, you're going to go down in flames. Okay, now how do you think I won Ohio by winning 86 out of 88 counties? And by the way, we're still to find out what happened in those two counties, okay? <laughs> and I won Cuyahoga County, which President Obama won by 40 points. Look, I think it's a bunch of things. I think it's policy, and I think it's style. I have never said this before, but I've been listening. George W. Bush, they told me, came to New Hampshire with his cowboy boots and just everybody fell in love with the guy. Huh? I mean, it wasn't what his position was on this or that, although he, we know he's a conservative. But people fell in love with who he was. And so part of it is policy, but part of it is the way in which you present yourself. And the people kind of look at you and think, ah, you know what, I don't trust any of them, but I maybe trust this person a little bit more than the rest of them. Am I right, ma'am? Okay, thank you. I have her in here stage just for this. Now, let's, let's just, um, let's talk about this for a while. I believe that all Americans are basically the same. I think there's four or five things we can talk about that everybody shares, and you tell me if I'm wrong. Just tell me. I'm 51 years old, and some guy walks into my office and says, I'm sorry, but you don't have a job anymore. You know, this is happening all over America. So what do you do? 
you know, if you're if you're if you're a man or a woman, you go you you've lost confidence in yourself, you've lost income, and you wonder how you're going to get up. And can you get trained for something that exists? If you're a mom and a dad, your kids went to college, they're living in your attic, and they got sixty thousand dollars worth of debt. And you're saying, what's going to happen to them? If you are uh, if you live in a community, you know, everywhere now, in New Hampshire, in Ohio, there's a tsunami of drugs. So you wonder, is it going to wipe out my community and destroy my family? If you are poor, you wonder, can I take my family up? If I'm a member of the minority community, is the system working against me? Or can I be safe to go to the mall? You know, so these are anxieties, sir, that I think every American has. And the person who can best speak to that, and not about woe is us, but you know, recognizing these are challenges. How do we get up again? How do we get on our feet again? And I think that's what people want to hear. Now, you've got your rock rib Democrats and rock rib Republicans. I saw this lady in Michigan the other day. She's from Ohio. I said, uh, hey, how do you think I'm doing in this presidential thing? She goes, well, I don't know, I'm not really following. And I said, well, uh, are you, you know, kind of hoping I'll do well? Will you vote for me? She said, absolutely not. There is no way I'm going to vote for you. Um, I said, well, well, you know, I did this, I did that. Yeah, those were all good, but no way are you getting my vote. I'm a rock rig Democrat, and you can forget that's not the majority of Democrats. And that's not the majority of Republicans. There are Republicans here that wouldn't vote for, am I right, for a Democrat under any set of circumstances. That's not the vast majority. And I remember Reagan's appeal to the blue-collar Democrats. And I think our message has gotten more and more sort of narrow and not appealing and uplifting, although we're winning governor's races and legislative races, and so there's a lot of, of good out there. But we need, to, we need to have big ideas, bold ideas. Yes, sir? Where do you stand on the Second Amendment? I'm for it. <laughs> yeah, it's right here. Would you comment on uh, the $15 minimum wage that you Fifteen dollar minimum wage. And you know, what you would yeah. do about minimum wage? And well, we have an. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Also comment on the relationship. I just had this big conversation on Facebook between government and business. Government yeah. and business. How do we? Right. You know, unbridled capitalism is no good. But socialism is no good. Yeah. Where do we go? Um, always amazes me that people say, well, you know, I had a conversation today on Facebook. <laughs> you didn't have, you talked, you didn't talk to them. You were just writing, you were just typing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just a bugaboo of mine. So anyway, here's the thing. You know, my kids have cell phones, right? I mean, they're 15. There'd be no point to ever placing a phone call to them. No. If you're not texting, you are out of it. So, uh, but anyway, look, I think we're, there's a number of things to say about the wage differential. First of all, mandating a 15, you used to, I, don't know if you read, I read the paper yesterday, they say that this is applied in New York to fast food restaurants, and so now fast food restaurants are figuring out how to not be fast food restaurants. They're going to rearrange their business. The other point that was made by a whole series of economists is if you just impose this, how many people do not get hired? What happens to the pay of the people who are currently working there because there's not enough money to give them the raises that they want? In Ohio, we raise the minimum wage over time. And um, you just can't impose these big wages uh, and just think everything's going to be hunky-dory. Um, is there a reasonable level that we can have a minimum wage that businesses can absorb and it can work? Yeah, we ought to be working with businesses and we ought to be talking about what's a reasonable level. But I kind of think the minimum wage should rest at the state level. Um, but look, a, a national conversation is fine, and we're having one now, because we're all worried about people working hard and not making enough money. Now, you know, when I say that 40% of our kids are graduating from high school, and they don't, they can't, they're not ready to go to college, that means they don't have any skills. Have you all heard of LeBron James? You know why he makes so much money? Because he has skills. People who have skills are the ones that get paid a lot of money. That's why education is so important. And not just college education, vocational education. Some people were born, 
I went to this nano company over here. You can't believe the stuff they're doing. They take these diamonds and they use it to cut things to, well, I, I can't even describe how 